D. Sims. Steve, I, I don't know if we've ever talked about this. Maybe you've told me, but I think what we should do is we should have a bit of a contest. We'll have our listeners guess, does the D stand for Daenerys, Delilah, or Daffodil? And it's dashing. Can, it's dashing. Yeah, I'm giving it away. It's yeah. just D for dashing. Yeah. The, I, I always what, what does it really stand for? Do you share? Is that a secret? Is that a trade secret? Not really. It's very boring. It's called David. But when we, when we released everything... Um, and we've always spoken about this on continuity across all platforms. There were some platforms where there already was a Steve Sims. So I just threw my middle initial in it and I suddenly found I could get everything. So that's the only thing. Even if it's not your initial, put a bloody letter or number in there and just claim it all. Yeah. It's like, you know, Brandon Turner, who you introduced me to, did Beardy Brandon because yeah. Brandon is impossible and Brandon Turner is impossible. Yep. So that, I thought that was brilliant. And your point about continuity, and we're getting right into the meat here, is it's one of those things, man, that, you know, you're so good at. It, Ralph Burns calls it the little hinge that swings the big door. Like you've got all these, these, and I don't want to call them small because they're not small, but they're, they're simple, not simplistic, simple. But they make a huge impact because now I can go on any podcast and I can say, follow me on all socials at Casa Muslim. Yeah, the daft thing is the P it's if it look for you know for for a fact, and you know we've known each other for long enough. If it's difficult, I won't touch it with a barge pole. Everything's got to be simple. And I've always said that a that a hammer is simple. Um, and so I am the hammer of marketing. I don't want you to be confused. I don't want to have to send you a challenge to where you find me. Um, and I know we're going to be wrapping this around speaking, but you're in competition with a lot of people. Don't have the first problem with them being able to find you or take you seriously. Right. So continuity, clarity, and simplicity are really effective marketing tools today. Yeah, I feel like you and Henry really own clarity too as a term. Like it's all over your website. It's, you know, kind of the thing that you're you're planting a flag in better than anybody else. And everybody I've ever seen go through you, I can instantly tell like, oh, Steve did his job because now what it is that they're offering, who they are, how they speak, all those things just get uh, far more clear. Yeah, there's a lot of, and, and you know this, and obviously the people that we surround ourselves with, are, you know, driven and people like this, they're masters at copy. Okay, and they're masters at amplifications and funnels and getting their message out. But if you start from a point of confusion, then you're just amplifying a confused message. So if you can focus on that initial micro, whatever it's called, if you can focus at the beginning of your journey with clarity, everything else is a walk in the park. Yeah. You know, what's funny, man, is I didn't make any real money. And so we niched all the way down to Google ads Yeah, and Google ads isn't a sexy offer. Like it's not a fun thing, but it's super clear. It's like, Oh, what do you do? Google ads. Got it. And then everybody knew, Oh, you need help with Google ads. Go to Cossum. Um, So yeah. it's a good lesson to learn. Yeah. I didn't learn it young, but if you can learn it young, if you're watching this, uh, there's still time for you. Um, let me, if you don't mind, Steve, for anybody who's watching this, if you, if you live under a rock and you don't know who Steve Sims is, um, he's my speaking coach first and foremost. Uh, he's former concierge to the billionaire stars, uh, like kind of the elite and has done some really, truly amazing things. Wrote a couple of phenomenal books about him. Uh, most recently was go for stupid, which was an international bestseller. I was at the book launch party. I had far too much to drink. Um, I taught everybody how to dance there, Steve. I don't know if you know that I have two dance moves. There's yeah. Twist the light bulb and then poke the sky. <laughs> and that's that's how you dance it's kind of but the delivery is how you deliver those it, it was about that that was about as much enthusiasm as i had for um and and since then steve you've uh you've started an agency uh with your son and and much smarter protege henry yes. yes uh who's truly brilliant and fun to listen to and and very insightful and 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 actually maybe the exact opposite of you he's very soft spoken he kind of doesn't love the spotlight. He kind of lives in the background. Uh, don't, I don't, I'm wondering about that. You, you think know? he's starting to break out a little bit? Yeah, because uh, for a start, he 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 did a really good day's coaching for our Sims Distillery community in New Orleans recently nice. and basically hogged the day. Um, and he's been doing podcasts. I think more than anything, and this actually will be a good thread for anyone here, 
there's a lot of people that think you need to be an extrovert, an expressive, an exhibitionist to be a good speaker. Mm. You need to know why you're doing it to benefit from it. And I think Henry didn't want to do it. Um, and as much as I play an extrovert very well, I like to be left alone. I like to be in a corner with people that I trust having a whiskey. I, I, I like I like my quiet time, but I know how it's beneficial. And Henry has realized how beneficial it is, and now he knows how to do it. So I think it's a case of don't think that you have to be X, Y, Z. Look, look at Jim Quick. Jim right. Quick is the capital of introvert. Yeah, he knows why he needs to work on stage, and he does it in accordance with his with his with his master plan. And Henry was always kind of, oh, I'm not going to do the stage. And then as soon as he realized what the benefit was, he's actually been doing more and more, and he's actually getting really good at it. I love hearing that because I I learn a lot from his videos. He posts really good videos on socials, and he always has good tips and tricks. Mm. Um, really good sound bites too. The thing I, I love about him is the distillation of information. He takes in a massive amount of information. And then he's like chat GPT for me. He's like, here are the three nuggets that you need to pay attention to. Um, and so if you're not following Henry Sims, I imagine he's, what's his social handle? handle? Uh, Henry D. Sims. Um, and he's the, the little, the little, how do we say this? Little bastard is in Milan at the moment. Oh, he's decided, guy. yeah, I know. And he sends me pictures of him and his tiramisu and wandering around getting his uh, parrot even and stuff. Now, he's uh, he's decided to get out there and just challenge himself with new cultures. And he's in um, Milan, uh, Berlin, and then I think he finishes at Madrid, and then he then he heads on back. So he's out there just kind of like, you know, spreading his uh, his wings and just trying new cultures at the moment. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of proud of him for doing that. And you, you are right. We're very opposite on so many elements, but... I think when it comes down to it, the only thing that unifies you whenever you do any kind of business together is what's the point of X. Mm. And if the point is to get the spotlight, well, that ain't going to last two seconds. So there's always got to be a, what's the point of what do we have to do to keep that point and that momentum going? So I think that's where we're so different, but then so unified on the same point. I love that. And if you don't mind, Steve, we're going to dive into some speaker training because that's what we promised everybody. If you want to kickstart your speaking career, um, Steve is my speaking coach. I had never been paid to speak until I started working with Steve Sims, uh, something he actually berated and bullied me into. Steve, you've spoken on, I mean, it's it would it would almost not be hyperbole to say you've spoken on every major stage in the world. Yeah. And then also some kind of obscure stages too. And those might even pay more. Like, I don't, I forgot the last one you and I were on the phone. And you're like, oh, the women's junior hockey league or something. Oh, yeah. Me out. What was that? Where did you go? I, I, so I did, um, I did women's, I did a women's mindset retreat um, for women CEOs. Uh, and that was, that was interesting. I also spoke at the, um, uh, the under, what was it called? The sub, basically underground um, electricals. So when they, when you've got like a city and they pull up the manhole covers and they have all these electrics going through, there's actually these little uh, like GPS units that dictate what what is actually under the ground and what the connections are. And they had a conference for those. And I was the keynote speaker for it. So it's been weird where I've actually spoken. Um, this year I did, I finished, uh, last one was in Camarillo, uh, a week ago. I finished 20 gigs from Venice, Italy to Seattle, the home of grunge, um, did 20 gigs and 17 of them was paid and I get paid 30 to 50 grand a speech. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not, uh, -huh. uh it's not a small endeavor. This, no. this speaking career. And it's it's actually accessible. Like not all of us are going to be Steve Sims. Not all of us are going to know Elon Musk and Richard Branson and Elton John. But the thing that you taught me was I, I don't necessarily have to because as soon as I get clear on my message and I know what the point is, I can get on the stage from my perspective or my paradigm or, you know, kind of crowbar myself in with, with my little thing, which was um, – it just opened up a whole new world for me. And the thing that's cool about it too is not only do I get paid to speak, but when I speak, I'm speaking to an audience that's then going to buy my thing. 
And the thing that I think you're best at, at the at, at better at than anybody in the world that I've ever seen is multiple tiers of monetization for speaking. Because you don't just go up there, speak, and get paid for the speech. Like you've got 17 billion different ways to get paid for one side. Do you mind giving us a little peek behind the scenes on how you do that? Yeah, let's 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 crack it down to a couple of things. First of all, um, the biggest problem, and you may remember me saying this to you, um, the biggest problem you had when you started speaking wasn't your standard of content. Your content was fantastic. You just gave us five speeches in a 30-minute period. And it was like trying to sip water out of Niagara Falls. And in today's world, with so much coming at us, too much information equals no information. So the first thing that we worked on was to actually reduce the amount of content to something that could be digested. Okay, that was the first thing. You're the only person I've ever had that issue with. And the problem that a lot of people have is in their head with, I want to speak on stage. And the first thing they go is, I need a good speech. Writing and delivering a good speech is a completely different skill set to getting on stages. Mm. And that was that was that was my master, that was my master move. A lot of people, when they went, oh, I want to speak on stage. Right, okay, I better I better, you know, look like a speaker. I've got to have a website like a speaker. I've got to have a good speech. Yes, you have. But you've got to know how to get on those stages. And my roster of clients that I train how to speak on stages are people that you would be like, how the hell does that person need you? But they don't know that link on how to get that story on that stage. Now, the fact is, you know, you're a Google expert and you're brilliant at your delivery. I know some famous names and I could pull that out, that out. But everyone's got a story and a pain that they then become the solution to somebody's problem. You've got a speech in you. You've got a book in you. You've got a story in you. If you've been through any pain, divorce, breakup, um, in a toxic relationship, being ripped off, selling a company, buying a company, whatever it is that you've experienced, there's someone somewhere in the planet that's going, I wonder how I do that, and you're the solution to that answer. Mm. And so you've just got to know how to deliver it, but you've got to know why, sh or you've got to ask yourself, why should that stage want you? And when when I suddenly started looking at it through the lens of the stage, as to why should you want me, I could deliver that answer and beat out way better speakers than me because I knew how to play that game. And one of the things I've often talked about is uh, Lady Gaga, okay? Now I ask you quite openly, is she a brilliant entertainer and is she making a lot of money from it? And the answer is yes, okay? Is she the best singer in the planet? Right. Probably okay. not. I'm gonna, I, I've often said, and no disrespect to Lady Gaga, I don't know her, but you could probably go down into the underground of London, Paris, New York, and listen to a busker that's got a better voice than her. Sure. But she knows the game, and she knows how to get the attention. And today we're in the intention industry. You know that through Google. Those that have your attention have your checkbook. And she knows how to engage and to grab your attention and to deliver. If you, you go back into the, you know, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, one of the best artists in the planet, most famous artists in the planet, was Andy Warhol. And Andy Warhol would screen print a, a, a freaking can of soup and then screen print it again in 30 different colors and walk around in his polo neck and his glass. Oh, that guy's a phenomenal artist. <laughs> Are you kidding? You know, if he had a conversation with, can you imagine a conversation between Picasso and Andy Warhol? And Picasso going, hang on a minute. I painted art. You screen printed freaking t-shirts, mate. You know, it's a totally different conversation. So what I'm trying to drive home is that if you do want to speak on stage, start looking at it from, what does the stage need and answer that question rather than what you think they need?
I love that. So let's start from let's start from step zero. Somebody's okay. watching. We've got a handful of and actually shout out Soren Tutu, longtime Solutions Eight subscriber, Kiss Casamasa. Chris, if you don't know, Chris paid uh, uh, Scorpion in Mortal Kombat, prolific, prolific actor, phenomenal dude. Brian Galky's here. I don't know him, but he sounds scary. Steve. Hey, yeah, that's the other weird fella. Yeah. I'm um, just kidding. Love you all. Thanks for being here. If you have questions for Steve, by the way, drop them in a chat. I'm paying most attention to uh, YouTube. So go check us out on YouTube. You can go to YouTube. Uh, just search for Solutions 8. You'll find us live if you're watching the stream from anywhere else. And we'll get to the questions here at the end. Um, starting from step zero, somebody's watching. Uh, let's assume that they already have their business, their niche, their industry, their service, and they want to segue into some form of speaking career. Yep. But that's all they have. Yep. They come to you, Steve. What do I do? First step, put the word speaker in all of your social bios. Mm. It is so heavily overlooked. But for any stage, now that stage could also be a podcast. But for anyone that wants to consider you, you know, puking out your nuggets of wisdom, they want to know that you take it seriously. So if you just add the word speaker in your bio, they can go, right, you take it seriously. Now, don't think that the second you put that in your LinkedIn profile, you're going to get your phone ringing off the hook. Doesn't happen that way. But you want to look as though you are prepared to accept that call. So the first tiny little thing, and I know for a fact Brian Golke and a lot of other people that I've worked with, the first thing to do is to go in there and put in the word speaker. Then the next thing you want to do is show that you take it seriously. Now, if you've got a website, what do you talk about? List three things, four things. You know, why you? Hey, through my trials and tribulations of going bankrupt three times or, you know, having 17 kids, I can talk about this. Or from launching the number one Google agency, I have... This is where you tell people why you are the one that can deliver that message. And here are the four things that during a presentation I can impact your audience with. Now, the speaker page is something that will never be finished. You know, when you've spoken at Harvard, that'll end up on there. When you've spoken at Traffic and Conversion, that'll end up on there. So it's always going to grow. So it's a constantly editable thing. My pictures I'm constantly changing of the different people that I'm speaking on stages with. So it's always a work in progress. But put up speaker and then at minimum, get a speaker one sheet put together. And mm. here's the myth. A speaker one sheet is never is never one page is always like two or three, but literally go on a Google and type in speaker one sheet and you'll see what other people's looks look on customs, look on Brian Galkies, look on mine. Um, that's what a speaker sheet would be. You don't even have to have a brilliant website, but if you've got the word speaker there and you've got a speaker sheet, people will go, okay, he takes it seriously because he's got the word speaker and he's got the speaker sheet that I need to read to be able to identify if he's ready for my audience. You know, it's funny about this, Steve. So what, that was when I started consulting with you um, and you became my speaking coach. One of the very first things you made me do, and you made me do it right there in front of you. I don't know if you remember this. We were at a, we were at a conference and, and you, I had my laptop up and you're like, go to your LinkedIn and we're going to crowbar a speaker right into your bio. And uh, when you said the phone's not going to ring off the hook, that's true, but it's actually pretty crazy how quickly it started to work. I just yeah. spoke last week at the InnoWave Summit, which was um, one of the largest marketing conferences in all of Europe. The director, I'm going to get this mildly wrong, but I'll get the gist right. The director of commerce for the European Union was there, 500 people, and they found me on LinkedIn because I had speaker in my title. So you know, it's not going to make it rain speaking gigs overnight, but it does work. And people do search by that. Like that's actually something that they're looking for. Yep, it is. I've got amazing podcast guest in my, in my bio. Yeah. So people contact me and they go, Oh, I hear you a podcast guest. Will you be on my show? So I don't understand with all of the social platforms being free why people don't put it on there. It's almost like they're scared to declare that they're a speaker or they're a podcast guest. You know, this is your time to make it 
impossible to misunderstand what it is you do. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. People are afraid to declare yeah. what it is that they want. And you just have to like plant a flag and say, hey, I'm a speaker. I'm going to do this. Well, they don't think they're good enough. And the downside yeah. is you go along to a lot of – or your your misconception of the world of speaking is that everyone has to be Tony Robbins or everyone has to be Gary V with a beanie on. You know, these are two people. The The world – is full of speakers. If you've got a story and you can deliver it, and the delivery is just a skill you learn or you get taught, you can actually speak on that stage. If what you went through can help somebody else, you almost have an obligation to be able to, to, to teach it. Right. And so as, as we brought up earlier, our friend Jim Quick, you, you know Jim, you've seen Jim speak, and he's very quiet and he's very slow. And he's a ninja with his with his speaking skills. And he doesn't want to be up there, but he know why he knows why he needs to be up there. And he's learned how to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's what makes him such a phenomenal speaker. But he is not Gary V. He is not Tony Robbins. He is not Steve Sims. He's Jim Quick. Yeah. And you wouldn't want him to be. Yeah, there's uh, a, a that's gentleman the that's on the board of our uh mastermind he's on our faculty his name's eric huberman you know eric yeah very well yeah and he does yeah yeah he's the ceo of hawk media 500 million dollar agency massive yeah. business brilliant guy what's interesting about him though is when he talks he comes in and he sits down and he gets real small and he sits in his stool and he's kind of you know you feel like he's tightly wound and after seeing him speak a couple times i'm like oh that's how he's most comfortable he's just sitting there sort of like yeah. a you know like an owl on a stoop thinking and he's he's really calm and, you know, like it's, he's the antithesis of what you think a stage speaker should be. If you were teaching stage, Eric is doing it all wrong. And yet he's one of the most captivating speakers I've ever seen in my entire life because everything he says is so interesting and so thoughtful. And you feel like you're having a conversation with him one-on-one. -on -one. But that's because Eric gets on stage and he's Eric. I couldn't do that. Like I get on stage and I'm kind of like all over the place and I'm pacing the stage and I'm pretty excitable and I'm loud. But that's, you know, I had to, I have to be me. Eric has to be Eric. So I think the the one of the big take home messages, especially if you're just getting started, is I wouldn't jump on stage and try to be insert this person I just saw here. Like if you're quiet, play into that. If you're loud, play into that. You know, like if you move a lot, play into that. And and I know that there are some technical facets that probably need to be reined in a little bit, but I just think that people are going to benefit way more from authenticity than from you know trying to put on some veneer that they're not going to be able to hold up. So let's break it down. The world of stages changes, just like technology. The world of stages changes on also what people want. Now, we're in a very aggravated society at the moment, and it's going to get worse. You know, we feel as though during COVID, we've been lied to. All of a sudden, we've got the cancel culture and the gotcha society, which makes us want to stop talking in case someone cancels our career. Terrible when you want to be a speaker. Mm. Now we've got world wars and arguments and bloodshed going on. And now what are we walking into? A bloody election year, you know? And are we in a recession, a depression, a distraction? Distortion? Fuck knows, you know? There's a lot of, of distortion going on in our world at the moment and you want to deliver a message but more than you delivering the message people want the answer to our problems so don't think that what you could have delivered 10 years ago as a speaker will work today i i heard someone say the other day and this was just after matthew perry had, had died mm. um and they said one of the greatest shows that ever was recorded friends could not be done today you think about that you know that the classic lines throughout friends could not be done today but it's still kind of like one of the greatest shows out there you know things change you need to change but the one thing that is very very strong today that isn't changing is the audience doesn't need to be motivated it needs to be answered what is the problem that that audience needs solved that you are the solution to that you can provide by the time you get off that? 
Now, in the old days, and this is one of the things that's going to give you an advantage, there's a lot of celebrities that are still managing to get speaking gigs. And I say still because it ain't going to last long. They get paid to go on stage. Everyone claps. They leave. And you go, well, what are you going to do with that? Oh, I don't know. But it motivated me. No, it aggravates because 10 minutes later, <laughs> you're going to realize that you never got any answers out of it. What I want is I want someone to go up on stage, not tell me that they're that concerned about what color that jet's going to be on the inside, not tell me that they made a billion dollars by, by lunchtime, but to spend the next 40 minutes telling me how I can be a better human being and how I, and when you are, and here's something that's very, very important. When you can show up as the solution to somebody else's problem, they don't care about your delivery. They mm. don't care about what you're wearing. You can be like this. You can be like this. It's completely irrelevant. It will be ignored as long as that impact is delivered. And that's what the stages are looking for today. Can you deliver a message that is going to solve the problem of my audience? And that's all they care. Yeah, and I think you're right about the age of the celebrity guru coming to an end. Yeah. Because of content saturation, like, you can get that anywhere. Yeah. I can, you know, I can sit there and listen to Matthew McConaughey anytime I want to. I'm probably not going to carve off the most valuable time in whatever conference I'm at. I remember HubSpot throwing up, like, they had, like, Anna Kendrick and, and Alec Baldwin go one year. And I sat in Anna Kendrick's because my wife's a huge fan and I wanted to get her book from, to bring home for my wife. And the whole time I'm like, what is she talking? You know, she was interesting. She's funny and she's good looking. And like, she's, there's a reason that she's an actress and she's on stage, but it was 45 minutes of my life that had nothing to do with anything, but we all just showed up because it's Anna Kendrick. It was, mm. you know, it was absurd, but I, I, but I, to the point that you're making, I think it's on the decline. And now what people really want is actual authentic value. Did you see Martha Stewart a couple of years ago at Traffic and Conversion? I, I know that she was headlining. I saw her in the VIP room, but I didn't watch her talk. Jesus. Was it bad? She told us the, how she came up with the names for her chickens. Oh, good. And I was sat there because I'm, I'm not you. I'm not in the VIP room. And <laughs> I was watching this. And the only downside was I had front row seats. Oh, good. You couldn't leave. <laughs> All I could think about was how can a 245 pound bald guy get up and discreetly walk away from the front center seat and nobody, including our mutual friend who was doing the interviewing, without anybody notice he's walking out to the bar or the toilet or to absolutely anything else other than listening to this. It was painful. It was painful. I just, this is a woman that stayed current. For so many years, she utilized con controversy. She she sidled up with Snoop, which was the weirdest collaboration, but also the best. That was brilliant. It was brilliant. And all she wanted to tell me was how she named her chickens. Yeah. Um, and I just felt cheated. And again, in this world, we are at a heightened sense of, of aggravation. And our tolerance is low. We don't want to be sold to. We want to be solved. And this was a person that could have given me great nuggets. But basically, wait, I ended up walking out, you know? And sadly, so did other people. Mm. Um, and it was such a shame that I, that I did when that person could have been there. Now, flip it on to another one. Did you see Magic Johnson? No, but I heard it was just like the best thing anybody's ever done. So we've got a classic basketball player, retired, a retired former great basketball player coming up in a marketing summit to talk to us about marketing when he's world famous for basketball. And I thought, all right, the first thing I did was I actually sat on the aisle seat. So if I had to bail, it wasn't going to look bad, okay? I'm not kidding you. I went home and I couldn't wait for that replay to come out on video. And then me and Claire sat around watching it. It, it was one of the best speeches I have ever seen. 
his presentation, his delivery. My God, he was the kind of guy that just made everyone feel as though he was their buddy within seconds and then dropped gold after gold after gold. And don't be surprised if he's at one of my events one day because I was a huge fan within seconds of him speaking because he knew what the conference was and he delivered the solutions. Mm. He was fantastic. So talk about your events for a little bit, Steve, because, you know, not only are you obviously a prolific speaker, but you're also a, a prolific, what would you call it, event producer? You put up the speakeasy, I think, is maybe the most popular you do. Yeah. Two or three. How many, how many are you doing a year? We do them twice a year now. Okay. Um, and the whole point, the whole premise behind it is that you, you know the city is going to be in, but you don't even know the location because we don't tell you that until four days prior. So... People literally are buying a ticket, not knowing where they're going, who's going to be there, what they're going to look. They know nothing. And we we quote it as the greatest mastermind you know nothing about. Um, but this year we kicked off um, starting the event in New Orleans. Um, and we had this really cool venue uh, above what's called the Absinthe House on Bourbon Street. Yeah, I saw the pictures. Which is a freaking circus to start with. Um we kicked it off with uh, funnel gorgeous genius Julie Chanel and then ended it with the high priestess of voodoo. So it was quite it was quite a ride and quite a climax and was a little bit risky to finish it off, you know, singing and doing voodoo chants. Um, but it was phenomenal. Uh, that that we had a standing ovation when we ended because I believe also in the pattern interrupt, which mm. is nothing new. It's classic Tony Robbins, but people think they want to understand this, but then they're given a fact that makes them go, whoa, hang on a minute. And when they do that, whoa, that's when you feed them with the information you need. You're brilliant at delivering that now. You know, you've done really, really well at slowing it down, poking the bruise, and then delivering them the antidote um, because they most want the antidote when the pain's there. No one wants pain tablets when they don't have any pain. So if you just poke it a little bit and then give them the Advil, they're like, give me the hit. I need it now. Yeah, well, I learned that from you. And going to your speakeasy events, I've been to, I don't know what, now a half dozen. Uh, and each one is, you know, when you, you said the, the, the high priestess of voodoo, I don't think that's the most risque speaker i've heard you put on stage we've um, had we've had a few <laughs> but you know i learned from people like i don't remember the gal's name you brought somebody who started a chain of donut shops oh that was um uh candace uh she she's no the one donuts they were sprinkles cupcakes that's what they yeah, yeah. so i remember she's getting on stage and, Wilson, yeah. and it's like sprinkles cupcakes and i'm like what are you doing, Steve? Like, what are, what are we going to learn? Yeah. Are you kidding? Like, come on, man. Like, bottom of the barrel. Was it a bad day? Did you forget? Like, <laughs> and then egg on my face because, like, holy shit. She was an entrepreneurial genius. Yep. The talk had nothing to do with cupcakes. And what's interesting about that is she proved it later because then she opened a, a chain of pizza shops. And she, yeah. was, uh, uh, she was a master of scale, branding, marketing, location real estate negotiation and within 45 minutes had reframed the way I think about how I would start and scale a subsequent business from cupcakes, you know, like talk about a pattern interrupt. Actually, that's a, that's a good point because it's something that speakers need to understand. There's the, you, both of us have got kids. Okay. So we know the, 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 the fun and the trauma and stuff like that, but for any parent out there, the kids don't look at you like a superstar. When you know, I live here in Hollywood, so falling over celebrities is pretty easy here. But I had Gary Oldman uh, and his son at, at Henry's school, and he was in Henry's class. So we used to go to all of these parties at Gary's house. And I remember sitting next to Gary Oldman, and it was a case of, you know, your, your kids must be over the moon, you know, having that dad who's like, you know. And at the time, I think he was doing um, uh, Harry Potter. Um, oh, but he wow. was also he was also in Batman, so he was he's always been very very well known. And he said the kids never see Gary Oldman 
they see the doofus dad. Yeah. He said, but any B-class actor that comes over, that's the superstar. Now, here's the thing. If I had said to you that I was going to give you a speaker that was going to talk about scaling, and let, let's talk about a mutual friend of ours, Ryan Dice, mm. okay? He runs Scalable, kind of knows a thing or two about Scalable. If I brought him into the room and said, hey, here's Ryan, you're going to go, great, we're going to talk about scaling. And you're going to be prepared to receive the information as you've built up the parameters in order to receive it. But I've now introduced you to a girl and I'm talking to you about cupcakes. You're like, hang on a minute. Bang, that's that pattern interrupt. Yeah, exactly. So if you say it, hey, you're dad. But if the cool uncle says it, it's gospel. So the first thing that I taught you, and you'll remember this, is I said, we need to get you out of a sandpit where you're compared to everyone else that's singing the same tune and put you into a room where people can go, oh, my God, I didn't know this existed. And you now become the savior, the solution, because you're now no longer singing in the choir. You're now Beyonce. Mm. And that's what you did very, very well. And I've seen how you've come out uh, of your shell to be able to deliver. And of course, when you've delivered in an environment and seen the eyeballs, they suddenly realize how wonderful you are. More importantly, you do. And now, quite openly, seeing you host the Driven Mastermind, which is one of the greatest masterminds out there. I'm on the faculty. I'm a member. I love the damn thing. But seeing how you actually orchestrate it and see it as loads of different problems, let's cater the solutions. You're actually, you've come out and you, you've, you've grown so much in identifying what is the point rather than how can I be? One of them is an I problem. The other one's a you solution. Yeah, it's interesting because it's so easy to hop on stage and instantly start thinking about yourself. And that's the natural reaction and the wrong thing to do. And the minute totally. you, you turn around and you think about the audience, now you're there to serve. And that's uh, why all of these old school speakers are having so many problems. I've got I've got a couple of boys on my on my roster at the moment that I'm working with that um if I mention their names, you'll be like, How why are they with you? Because they're stuck in five years ago. And they don't realize that the stages today are asking for something different. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to think of not, not why you should be there, why they should want you to be there. And it's a different position. We got a question that just came in from a mutual friend. Shout out to Adam Raymer Brown. Never heard of him. Yeah. Adam has been to every speakeasy Steve's ever done, by the way, if you're watching. So this is the way Steve treats his friends. <laughs> Adam asks, um, when you're starting to speak, is there a time it's beneficial to speak for free or maybe to be in an important room? Uh, I, th For start, always focus on the room. Uh, there was one gig that the room just made no point in me being there. And then when he came to me about asking me about the price, uh, and he knows this, I actually, I, I inflated my fee three times. And at the time I was asking for, I think, 15 to 18 grand. So I went, oh yeah, if you go, I'm, I, I'd be 45 grand. And the bastard paid it. Um, and it was kind of like, oh, this is great. You know, I was talking for 15, but now I'm getting 45. But it was actually a really, really tough gig because there was nothing relatable and they just wanted some funny stories and a mm. bit of entertaining. And um, as I basically said to Claire when I got back, I, I, I was the prostitute for an hour. You know, I was the hour-long entertainment, the showgirl. There was no substance. So I always, and, and Adam will know this very much, and you know this, I always focus on the room. Who's my audience? Who are the people in there? Can I connect? Can I, can I make them uncomfortable? You know, can I disrupt what's going on here? and then provide the solution when they're at a point in time to be able to receive it. So I always focus on the room. Room first. Now, you're saying about the monetization. If it's the right room, you can monetize that room. Because, mm -hmm. hey, I've just shown you what you need to do. Will you do it? Or do you want me to help you do it? 
So you can always monetize the right room. So always, always, always the right room. Now, should you be, that brings in a question where people go, well, if I'm being paid by the room, I shouldn't try and be paid by the room. You know, how many times have me and you custom had a conversation about charging? Every time we've ever spoken twice. <laughs> and the bottom line of it is when you get paid, you get treated differently. Oh God, it's so true. And I mean, not just a little different, it's night and day. It's unbelievable. Yeah, you get the hotel. You get the, you get the, uh, the, the, the proper positioning. You know, I was, I was keynote at TNC. And let's, let's call it out. I was keynote at TNC, okay? Let's not labor on it, but I was keynote at TNC. Where, where was your room? I was like, Ballroom 2B on the third floor in the corner behind the cactus. You had to go to the dude in the yellow poncho. His name was Frank. He'd point you there. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Indiana Jones had trouble finding Carson at the event. Yeah, you know, but Carson was in a far far superior sandpit. He knew the room, he was a far better speaker for the topics, but I got the keynote. Now, the bottom line of it is because I positioned, I pushed, and when they spoke to me, and you know this because we always talk about this, when I'm speaking with a stage, the statement of, hey, I'm really excited to be chatting with you about being a, and you know the word, keynote speaker, yeah. at your, right at the beginning, you drop that into the conversation. Because all of a sudden they go, oh, he wants to be keynote. Not featured, not other speaker. I'm not the fluffer on your set here. Right. I'm the main attraction. And so it's all about positioning it in. You can monetize that room, but you should also monetize being there. Because bearing in mind, if you're showing up as the solution to someone else's problem, you're making that event great. And if you can make that event great, and make everyone in their audience go, my God, this event was brilliant. I had Kasim up there, and he's taught, like, you have so many times taught us so much that's enhanced our businesses, then you deserve to be paid to be there. Speaking of making the event great, one thing that you do better than anybody, Steve, and you taught me this too, and I still don't do this very well, man, to be honest with you. I need to get better. When somebody hires you to speak, like you shot it from the rooftops before, during, after, you do more promotion for some events than the event does. Hmm. And talk to me a little bit about the strategy there because it's absolutely brilliant. So there's there's two. Um, for start, for start, I charge. I don't have any fee phobia, you know? I'm now 30 to 50 grand a gig, okay? And I've got no problem whatsoever of saying that because you're not just getting a speaker. You're getting part of your marketing. Hmm. And so when I speak to people, I will say to them, and this, this wins me a lot of business. Who are you thinking of having at the gig? Well, I've got, let's call him out, Gary V, Richard Branson. Um, you know, these, these standard of people there. That's fantastic. Or oh, just wanted to ask you, will they be promoting your event? I've never seen Richard or Gary ever promote an event that they're speaking at. Yeah, never not once. Never not once, not going to happen, okay? Oh, that's a bit strange, isn't it? All you've got to do is say that to the person you're talking to, and they're like, hang on, it is, because I'm spending, like I know for a fact, Richard's now 450 grand. I helped him get a gig in uh, uh, Texas, mm. 450 grand. How many Instagram posts do you think he put up about that gig that he got paid nearly half a mil to speak at for an hour? But if you turn around and go, well, let me help you out. Because one of the things I like to do is if I'm going to work with an event, I like to shine some love on the event. So if you can make sure that I get the appropriate assets, good flyers showing me at the event, I would like to promote that to my community. In fact, do you have a podcast? Let's let's talk about it on your podcast. Do you do IG lives? Let's do an IG live. Do you want me to record a little video from the garage around me bikes or something? Going, hey, if you want to be a so-and-so, then great. If you don't think you should, 
I'm telling you why you should. Let me have all of a sudden people go, well, hang on a minute. This isn't just a speaker. It's part of my marketing strategy. Mm. Now, let me ask you this. And the ladies in the house will understand this. The ladies and Brian Gulk. So if you were going on a date with me, but you'd had a conversation with my other, my last girlfriend, and that last girlfriend said, and I'm going to be dramatic here, that there were violent episodes. Now look at your face. That's a he said, she said situation. Mm -hmm. But do you want to be on that first date with me now? Yeah. No, 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 no. There's a little bit of concern here. But just imagine that last girlfriend said, my God, he showered me with flowers and was so polite and just would just open the door. And oh my God, my mum really misses him. You know, now you're thinking you've got the catch of the century. Now, every stage I have ever spoken at since I started doing this has made a comment as to how I handled the other stages I was on. Mm. You know, I was the good date. You know, I was the good relationship. Now, I'm going to tell you, and you know this for a fact, I've spoken at some turd holes. I have spoken at some events which, oh, my God, I would rather not talk about. But every single one of those events I have literally marketed, spoken about like they were Wembley. And I will never mention the name of bad events I've spoken at. I will never speak about bad venues I've spoken about because that's that's my situation. But every event has turned around and gone, I love the way you marketed that event. I love the way you did the I love the way you did this. I love the way you made that event look so great. And I've even had some people going, and I went to that event and it was shit. <laughs> but not if I looked at your Instagram profile, if I looked at your Instagram profile, my God, it was Harvard. So can you do that with us? How you actually handle you speaking on the stage before you speak on the stage will get you on loads of other stages. That's brilliant. Steve, if somebody wants to work with you, how do they do that? They send me a really large check or maybe Venmo. Um, I'm really picky because I don't want, I can't work with ego because I don't know how to monetize it. Okay. So if you're looking to just show up and be all fancy and flashy, don't contact me because I can't help you. But if you want to work the system in the way that it could work best for you, visit stevedsims.com, go into the contact page, send me uh, a, a, an email or go onto Instagram, whatever. Send me a message. I'm Steve D. Sims everywhere. Look up the speaker training on the website so you know the kind of shit that you're going to be forced to do in order to make it work for you. Yeah. And one real quick plug, if you don't mind, we're in a mastermind together called Driven, which is high end. It's meant for, you know, you doing a million dollars in gross revenue or, or more, probably much more. It's 30 grand for the year. You created something that was meant, I think, for people that are emerging yeah. and are, let's say, pre-driven. Talk to us a little bit about that mastermind. I think that's a beautiful way to put it. And I would very much declare that it's pre-driven. Um, driven has a is a level and it's the classic i can get you from here to here but i can't get you from there to there and so i run sims distillery along with henry to basically disrupt you get you in a position get you growing get you scalable get you into a point where your resources are no longer a concern to you but your scaling is and that's when you would move in a driven so i would definitely say that the precursor to, to driven is sims distillery.com yeah and if you're not in a mastermind um that's that's a hell of a deal that you've got going on over there, Steve. So if you're not in a mastermind, go check out Sims Distillery. Check out stevedsims.com. Check out Steve D. Sims on all socials. And if you're thinking about speaking, this is my dude. And not just mine. I mean, I think you basically took the whole digital marketing world under your wing. There are quite a few, and we don't have to drop any names. We've but got quite a few people. Um, I actually, I, I just took on one. I took her on, I think, maybe about six months ago. We had spoken two years ago, and it was the like, I don't need this. No, no. What you talk, Steve, it's, it's very nice. But this was a comment she made, and she's going to roll over when she hears this. It's a bit childlike. 
was the statement that she made because it's so simple. But a smack in the mouth is simple and it's impactful at the same time. So I said to her, yes, it is, because you need to focus on that. And she was like, ah. And then she came over on summer and joined up. I love that. That's awesome, man. Steve, thanks for being here. Thanks for serving our audience. Appreciate you. Always uh, a pleasure spending time with you, my friend. Yeah, likewise. And um, if you're watching, like, comment, subscribe, do all the stuff. You know how social media